I've, I've had a pretty good weekend. This, this weekend has been like, I don't know about y'all, but I, I've had a good weekend. Saturday was great. Like it started, you know, going out to the woods early. The, I've loved the cooler temperatures we've been experiencing in the morning. I think they call this fake fall. Like, um, like it's been great. It's been like down in the 60s. I've been able to sit on my porch a little bit, drink some coffee before work, get the kids ready and, and stuff like that. It's, just, it's been awesome. Yesterday, I put up a bunch of tree stands in the woods and was out doing that. And like, I didn't sweat to death. It was amazing. And I went home and like my grass needed to be mowed and I didn't mow it. Like I just, whatever, you know, I sat on the couch, got a cup of coffee and I watched this like football game, right? I don't know. Did y'all see Georgia Tech beat like like Florida State? Whoa, what was that? There's like a 59 yard field goal and like they just marched it down the field. It was amazing. And so I like drinking coffee, watching college football. And then last night, one of our friends, they had a birthday. And so we got to go out and hang out and, and play uh, some games and just have some fun in the water, have a great time. Um, so it's, it's been a, a great week. But have, have, you like, have you ever had a bad week? You ever like a week where you're like, gosh, I wish we could have skipped that one. Like, mm, that was hard, you know? Maybe, maybe you've been to that place in life where, you know, you've just you kind of come to the end. Like there's nothing in your tank and you just, you got no go left, right? There's, there's nothing left to do but stop. Because honestly, if you've been there, like, and I'm being honest, I've, I've found myself there from time to time. Whether it's, you know, with kids, sometimes like when it comes to parenting, I just want to be done. <laughs> like apparently I'm not doing it right. <laughs> I just, I just want to be done like or or I gotta run my kids here there and everywhere else and sometimes you know it's a lot or sometimes you know there's just stuff going on at the office and and it's just like I don't know how I'm gonna get it all done there's just like one thing after the other after the other or like at the house there's things that need to be done there's laundry that needs to be done there's like dishes that need to be done like the floors need to be done the the garden or whatever needs to be done the grass needs to be mowed it still needs to be mowed uh you know type thing and and it's just like there's not enough hours in the day you know what that's like it's like running a marathon i don't know who all runs marathons in here but in last service somebody ran a marathon and like i get it okay but i don't run marathons i just i don't do it uh type thing and it's it's hard it's, it's difficult when, when it's like there's this never-ending race and there's one thing after the other after the other. And, you know, going up and down those hills of responsibilities and endless, endless needs in life, it just sometimes it gets exhausting. I mean, it's, it's almost like I compare it to um, years ago. I was, I was at this youth camp as a camper. And I made this incredibly not so smart decision to be a part of what was called the hardcore running society. Like I decided every morning that I was going to get up at six o'clock before everybody else. And I was going to get together with these other folks, including the camp director. And we were going on a three mile run, like all week long. For me, I'm not used to like running more than one or two miles, but I'm like, I'm going to be a part of the hardcore running club, the hardcore running society. So every day, you know, we got together and we ran and you got to understand like I'm I'm like from the north so I'm like used to running where it's like midwest I guess like it's flat like where I lived uh up north it was like flat like fields flat you could see really far and like this was this was like a northern part of the state and so it was like up and down and up and down and like hills add like a whole nother dimension to running and so I remember running this route and, and I'm like, I can do it, you know. And we start off, we're kind of in this big cluster. And, and then you see, like, the people who are going to be like, well, I'm going to go faster than everybody else. And, and I'm kind of somewhere in the middle and being like, yeah, I'm not like those guys behind me. And, and I remember, like, the moment came when I remembered I, I was last. Like, I realized everybody has passed me. And not only have they passed me, but, like, I, I can't, when I come up over the next hill, like, I can't see them. They're, like, they're way far gone. And, I, and I, got, I got really discouraged. And slowly, like, my run turned to a jog, turned to a walk. And I'm, I'm all alone on, on this dirt road outside the camp, and I'm just kind of shuffling along. And I'm thinking, what's the point of going any further? And why continue to try? And I just, 
It just kind of felt like turning back. You know, like, like giving up. And I'll leave off right there for now, but I think sometimes if we're honest, this is where we find ourselves, like in life. This is where we find ourselves uh, spiritually. Things happen in our lives that, you know, maybe disrupt our relationship with Jesus, disrupt our relationship with the church. Maybe like at one time we were excited about the Bible, but like now it's a struggle. We're like, oh man, this is just getting difficult. Or, or maybe where we once, you know, we're excited about like going to church. It's just like, oh, it's so much easier to just like sleep in or, you know, get up and go do something else. And, you know, we're not looking forward to it as much as, you know, we, we once did, right? Or, you know, additionally, we maybe love serving and, and being part of some kind of team, doing something, making a difference in the community. But, you know, it just, it just seems like there's not as many people involved as there once was. We're not, not really making a big impact like we were before. And, you know, maybe there's, maybe there's other scenarios that you can think of that, that would fit. But, you know, I just think about this little house church that we've been studying all summer long. And, and the realities that they were facing. And, and the scripture tells us that they were tired. Like, like they, were, they were dealing with a lot. And, and they found themselves growing weary and growing tired. And, and I would suggest that there are moments where we too find ourselves in that position. We're just weary. We're tired. And, and we feel like slowing down, like stopping, like, like uh, you know, turning back and such. And my friends, it's, it's in those types of moments that I, I would encourage us to reflect on some of the scripture that we're going to be studying today in Hebrews chapter 12. Because what we're going to find here are like motivations, key motivations to think and reflect on when we feel like giving up, when we feel like quitting, when we feel and grow spiritually weary. And if, if you look at like the, the very first word of Romans chapter 12, verse 1, we're going to throw it on the screen. It says, therefore, we're going to come back to that in a moment. But it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and, and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And that word, that word, therefore, at the beginning is, is, a, is a, like a, a connector, right, to the, to the previous chapter. We talked about that a little bit last week, chapter 11, where, where we encounter these folks who are considered a, a cloud of witnesses who, you know, uh, by faith conquered kingdoms and administered justice and, and saw mighty movements of God, right? Uh, there was mention of, of people like Daniel, Right, who, who didn't give in to the culture of the day, who wasn't swayed. There, there was mention of, of people like Rahab, like, who decided to, to listen and heed the warning of the spies like, who, who were telling her, like, you know, God is, is going to deliver this city over into the hands of the people that are for him. And you better listen up, you know, and we, we talked about others, like different prophets, and, and we talked about Moses and, and all of their faith, and how like even in the hardest times and situations, like God was faithful to them. And, and the scripture is telling us here to think about those individuals, right? Those women and men in chapter 11 who didn't give up, who didn't quit, but endured and pressed on despite hardship, d- despite, uh, you know, Uh, persecution in uncomfortable situations. The author said, God has something planned for you and it's better. It's better. It's a, it's a better resurrection. It's a better life where you're going to be perfected in every way in Jesus. You follow me? There's the author's like, you need to think about these folks who paved the way. They're, they're the examples that we need to be following to, to keep going. Even though they felt like quitting, they didn't. And we see the result of that. God was faithful. But then in verse 3, we learn that Jesus himself is also our example. 
Like, to think about this, like, Jesus, God made flesh, he was not exempt from weariness. He wasn't exempt from hardship or temptation to give up. He, he went to the cross and scorned its shame. That's, that's an interesting word. We don't use it very often, and it actually doesn't appear very often in, in the Bible, the word scorn, right? But it means to look down on. It, it means to treat as little value, to think nothing of. In other words, uh, the weight of his punishment was nothing compared to that which was to gain. Where the cross was meant to put Jesus to shame, to make people think little of Jesus, Jesus like flips the script. The cross is meant to think little of him. He thinks little of the cross compared to what was to gain. Compared to the plan that God had, his father and his love for us and his love for us. It's nothing. It was nothing compared to what he had planned for us, to his and his father's love for us. And so in our weariness and the seeming drudgery of life, when we feel like quitting, when we feel like giving up or, or um, you know, just being done with it all, we can find motivation in that, one, we're not alone, and two, we've, we've got examples that, like, can give us evidence that's like worthy of don't give up, don't quit, keep going. Because in the end, it's going to be worth it. Others have been where we are, have, have persevered, and they've, they've made it through. And if they can do that, so can we. Flat, flash back to my little running excursion where I, I left us. You know, I'm, I'm on that three-mile run. I'm headed towards the end. Again, that may not seem far for some people, but in those hilly conditions, you know, that would be, have been the furthest I had ever run. And um, I was contemplating giving up. I was contemplating going back. And then I remember, like, way in the distance... I saw I was coming up on somebody. So you know, kind of pick up the pace a little bit. I kind of look like I'm running. I can't be walking anymore. Somebody else is around. I got to look like, you know, put on the persona. And, and so, you know, I start picking up the pace and running. And, and, and I began to realize it was my cousin. And I wasn't catching up with him because he was so slow and I was so fast. I was catching up with him because he knew I was running alone. And he dropped back so he could run with me and be an encouragement to me. And so we ran along together, and he gave me someone, uh, or he was, he was an encouragement to, to me to keep going, and, and we began to talk and those kinds of things, and I began to forget about how hard the running was, and all of a sudden we came upon it. Big Bertha. It was the hill of all hills. It marked the, the halfway mark of the run. And I, I remember, like, running and trying to get to the top and him cheering on. And, and finally we made it and we stood at the top. Yeah, we made it. Didn't think I'd ever get here. And then we began the run back down. And I'd like to say I ran with uh, uh, an awesome renewed vigor all the way back to camp. But I didn't. I got to the bottom of the hill and I started walking again. Because I was tired. It took everything to get up to the top of that hill. And so we walked and walked and walked. And then finally, way off in the distance... We see this little white van approaching, and we realized that it was full of all the campers who had been on the run and realized we hadn't made it back yet, and they were worried. <laughs> and they're like, you guys are going to miss breakfast. You need to get into the van. And, and so, you know, we, we, we pile in to the van, and, and they take us back so we can get nourished and have some food and, and make sure we're back where breakfast is waiting. And for me, for me friends, that, that's the picture of the church, all right, where they don't they don't leave people to run alone. They, they don't leave people to, to like go through this life by themselves. But, but when they're having a hard time, they, they adjust the, their pace. They adjust their pace of life to, to stop and to help and, and to encourage. And when they're concerned about somebody, they you know, load up a van of people and they drive out and go find them type thing. That, that, that's the picture That's the picture. I don't know who may need to hear this this morning. But I want to know, I want you to know, whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing, whatever the difficulty may be, you're not alone. You're, you're not alone. In fact, I believe that so much, I want you to turn to the person next to you and tell them, you are not alone. You're not alone. Say it. 
And then the other person, you know, you receive it and you say, thank you. You're not alone either, right? There's a reminder. Don't make it weird, <laughs> right? You're not alone. I know I'm not alone. No, that's not what I'm talking about, okay? You're not alone. You have people here for you. I'm here for you. And so practically, you know, that, that looks like praying for each other. Like when we pray, we, we pray for each other. Because when we have hardships and we have difficult times, there's, there's a whole crew of people around here that can pray for us. Like after service, like we invite people to come forward. We'll pray with you if you have needs. Like we hand out these connection folders, these little black folders where we write with pencils. You guys remember that was? It's like before texting. Like we, we like take prayer requests for each other. Like we, we have prayer gatherings and prayer meetings. Last night or yeah, uh, Friday, we had, a, we, had, we had a prayer gathering here at our dream team gathering. We were praying for each other. Because we believe that stuff happens, like God moves when we pray for and with each other. I think practically, practically it, it looks like, you know, being part of a, a group of people who are there to encourage you and like spur you on. Like we call those connection groups here. We we're having signups this morning. Like I think we have like 11 or 12 of them that, that you can be a part of. And, and it's not only where we, we learn to pray with and for one another but like we learn God's word and, and not just learn it, but we actually implement it and, and practice it in our lives together. And, and those can be, you know, at a place of business. They, they can be in your homes. Uh, you know, they can be on campus type thing. But, but that's, that's what the church looks like. It looks like being present in each other's lives. If you're a student, not only is it here, but on Wednesday nights we have youth group. And like being a part of that. Like people your own age gathering together and like worshiping God and encouraging one another and, and having fun and just being present and around one another, going to camp and, and eating out and those kinds of things. Like it, it encourages us, it moves us forwards and reminds us that we're not alone. And I'm sure, listen, there's other scenarios and other ideas that you can come up with. But the point is, if we're weary or struggling to remember, we're not alone. We're not by ourselves, and we have examples that we can look to and see that reality and how it played out. And so that's the first encouragement. The second one is in verse 4, the second motivation, where Scripture says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have completely forgotten the word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son. It says, my son... Do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're not legitimate. You're not true sons and daughters at all. And, and just really for lack of better terms here, the author begins by creating comparison of what Christ endured on the cross, like to what the people of this little house church were enduring. I mean, this was uncomfortable. Remember, like Rome had kind of expelled them. Like they were treated as second class citizens. But yet they hadn't, they hadn't endured suffering to the point of, of shedding their blood. They, they haven't even faced or had to deal with what Christ dealt with on their behalf. And it's not so much as to say, you know, suck it up, princess, as it is to, to say, look at what God did through Christ's suffering. Look at what God did through Christ's suffering. If God can do that with the difficulty of those circumstances, if he can snatch life from death out of those circumstances, bring good, or bad, good out of bad out of those situations, certainly it's within his realm of capability for, for you in your circumstances. Be encouraged. God has not abandoned you. And he can handle anything that you're facing. He can bring good out of whatever it is that you're going through. So keep going. Keep, keep going. Don't, don't give up. And if you notice, the author takes it a step further because to this little house church, their, their hardship, their struggles, their, their persecution, if we can call it that, would have been interpreted as evidence that, that God had forgotten about them. 
Have you, have you ever felt, felt that way? Like, God, why don't you care that, that this is happening to, to me? Or why don't you care that this is happening to us or, or to them? On the contrary, the, the author actually says, God is, God is treating you as sons and daughters. Like our persecution or like discipline, our hardship proves all the more that we actually belong to him, that we're his children. Think about that. Their faithfulness in the difficult times actually proves that they belong to God. It's evidence that they belong to him. It doesn't disprove that God cares about them. It proves that they really do belong to him because he suffered. And he said, hey, guys, you're going to suffer too. Right? Don't think this is strange. Don't think this is odd. I mean, if I were Satan, God help us. If, if I were Satan... I would want things to go well for people. I would want people to be comfortable in their lifestyles. I wouldn't want them to experience any difficulty. Because the moment they do, they're going to look for something bigger than themselves. And there's a chance that they might find God. So I'm just going to make things nice and easy so people don't have a reason to call out for God. And that's exactly the argument that the author is refuting here. The proof that God cares about us and, and that we care about him is actually revealed in hardship, in difficulty. The, the point being, when we feel weary, when we feel like giving up, we need to remind ourselves that, that we have a coach who is, who is more than just a coach, Like God, God doesn't ask us to do something that he has not already done or isn't willing to do himself first, right? Think think about it like, like creation. If we go back all the way to the Genesis account in, in chapters one and two, and, and we read this story, right? Hebrews 11 mentioned this. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit created all that is. Like cause reality to come into being. And yet the pinnacle of creation, right? Humanity, like people, human beings, bearing his image, right? The Imago Dei. In Genesis 3, we learn after like he creates human beings, like he creates them. Don't even get out of the third chapter. And they betray him. They, they violate the trust relationship that they have with God. They're, they're like, I know better than you, <laughs> right? I know you said don't do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. You follow me? God created humanity in the very next scene. Humanity rebels against God. They, they, they reject him. Not only that, we get to the, the next chapter, chapter four, right? Chapter three, they reject God. They, 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 they sin against God. Chapter 4, we see humanity turning against humanity. When, when Cain, the son of Adam and Eve, kills his brother Abel out of anger and jealousy. So not only do human beings like hurt God, they begin to hurt each other. And it's easy to think at that point, well, why in the world would God create such a people capable of, of such evil, capable to choose to do these kinds of things? And interestingly enough, the answer is love. He loved, loves and loved people so much that, that he gave them a choice. Because love's not love without a choice. Without a choice, it's slavery. So he, so he gives them a choice because he loves them. Even though he knew that some would turn away from him or reject him and violate their relationship or would cause harm to one another. He, he chose to create them anyway because there would be people who would choose to love him back and there would be people who would choose to love one another and care for each other and encourage one another. So follow me. God knows what it's like. Listen, God knows what it's like to love and to lose. He knows what it's like to love and to lose. He knows what it is to have wonderful relationships with people and have poor relationships with people. He, he knows what it is to want to be in relationship with people and those he wants to be in relationship with wanting nothing to do with him. 
He knows what that is. God knows that. He knows rejection. He knows heartache. We, we see it in the person of Jesus who cried out in Luke chapter 23, verse 34, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Do, do you know heartache? Do you know disappointment? Do you know suffering? So does God. So does, so does Jesus. We have, we have a coach who's more than just a coach. A great high priest who is able to empathize with our weaknesses. Who knows what it is. Listen. Who knows what it is to want to give up. Who in the garden of the Gethsemane, before the crucifixion, prayed, Father, if it is all possible, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to do it. I don't want to go through it. Please, 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 if it's possible. Yet not what I will, not what I want. What you want. And he endured the cross. If the Son of God was willing to endure all of that for us, shouldn't we, like this little house church in Rome, be able to endure, go through, stand a little bit of comfort, discomfort? A little bit of things not going our way. The, the little bit that we might suffer for him. Right? This, is, this is why we, we turn our thoughts to him when we feel like giving up. Because he knows. This is, this is why we, we think about him when we grow weary. It says, consider him who endured such opposition. That's verse 4. So that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Practically, what does that look like? And honestly, I think sometimes it looks like doing things that we don't naturally want to do. That's what I think it looks like. Doing what's hard. Go, going through the difficulty anyway. For, for me, that, like, one of the practices I have is, is fasting once a week. I go for like 15, 16 hours without food, sometimes 24. And I, I don't know about you, but when, when I don't eat for like 15, 16 hours, like, my stomach's like, what's wrong with you? Why aren't you feeding me? I'm hungry. Gets a little angry. Like my attitude dips. Ask my wife. You're fasting today, aren't you? Yes. Right? I get hangry. Your energy level drops. And they get those hunger pains. They, they remind me that Jesus knows what hunger is. Like he, went, he went 40 days without food. Surely I can give up lunch or like maybe a few hours, maybe even a day to demonstrate my dependency on him, to draw close to him. Or, or maybe, you know, I sense God asking me to serve in some capacity, serve my church or serve my neighbor in some capacity. And you know, I, I don't really want to do that because it takes away from me time. Right? I like my me time. Anybody else like their me time? Right? Some of y'all are like, what's me time? I like my me time, and I only get so much me time. And yet Jesus, he went from town to town to town with, with no place to lay his head. He'd try to take a nap or go have some me time, and the, the crowds would find him. Like they'd get in a boat and go to the other side of the lake, or they'd track him down or, or skirt around the edge or whatever. You know, they were, they're finally, Jesus, we need you. Jesus, we need you. Please, 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 please. They just never left him alone. And every single time, he had compassion on them. He'd meet their needs. He'd give up his, his me time. Certainly, we could meet someone's need like, like he did. Uh, you know, I'm sure we can go on with other examples, but hear me, because this isn't a guilt thing, all right? This is not a guilt thing. This is a trust thing. It's saying Jesus can meet my need, and as, met, as, as, as he has met my needs, right, I can meet other people's needs. And if I'm meeting other people's needs, I can be certain that he is going to meet my need because he's faithful. That's, that's who he is. And it's who he'll continue to be. That's, that's, that can motivate us, right? We have a coach who's more than just a coach. 
We, we have examples. We're not alone. And we have our last motivation when we feel like giving up, and we find it in verses 9 through 17, which, which tells us about the discipline of earthly fathers. It uses those examples, right? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but but painful, uncomfortable. But God disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share in his holiness. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, so that The lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Right? You're going to do something about what's going on. Make every effort, it says, to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you saw, or as you know, when he wanted to inherit his blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. If you don't know the story of Jacob and Esau, you might want to go read it, go look it up. He was the firstborn. He had inheritance. And one day he was really hungry, right? He was angry. Ah, and he had a bad attitude. And his brother came in from hunting in the woods. And, and you know, he was just famished. And, and so, like, we had this soup. And he was like, I'm really hungry. And he's like, well, you can have some soup, but I want your birthright. And he's like, take my birthright. He scorned it. He looked down upon it. That's the background here. And so just very simply, as as we look at this passage as as a motivation for continuing on with Jesus when we're weary, discouraged, or encounter difficulty, it's it's understanding that, that we are being shaped for heaven. We're being shaped for heaven. God is making us holy. God is helping us align with him and his will and his purpose for our lives. To take next steps with him and and begin to help others take next steps with him. To be holy. And I think a lot of us, you know, we've got baggage when it comes to holiness, right? We we got baggage like it's a bunch of rules. You can't do this. You can't do this. It's a bunch of prohibitions. It's about what you wear, and it's about how you dress, and, and, and your hair, and like what you like can and can't do, and those kinds of things. Like, that's what we think of like, like when that comes to mind. Some of us have that baggage, and we're like, we're done with that. Because it's all a, a bunch, about a bunch of a list of rules, and like, if we keep them all, then we can be good enough to get to God. But holiness is so much, so much more, right? Holiness is so much more. It, it's about, it's about, Listen, it's about being in right relationship with God. It's about having nothing separating you and God. It's taking all that stuff that gets between you and your creator and moving it out of the way so you can have a clear picture of God and you can move closer to him and be in relationship with him. And I want you to know, you can't move that stuff out of the way by yourself. Like you, you just can't. Can't, we can try, but we can't do it. It's only through surrendering our lives to him and his spirit in us that we're able to push those things out of the way so we can have a p- clear picture of God and knowing how he calls us to live and knowing how he wants us to live. He's the one who enables us to do that. And, and listen, the scripture says that as, as, as we're doing this, we're supposed to strive Strive toward that relationship. Strive towards holiness. That's what it says in verse 14. Make every effort to be holy. And and what's interesting that the texts point out here, right in the middle of this, right, is this this direct mention of sexuality. Like if if you don't know Rome, let me give you a a little uh, history lesson here. In their day, sexuality was a huge deal. As, As human trafficking was rampant, People would have been sold as uh, sex slaves. Children would have been victims of this. It's almost expected that, that husbands and, and wives would have other lovers, multiple lovers, other partners. And, and there would have been temple prostitution and lots of same-sex relations going on. And the comparison being made here is that in Roman society of which this church dwelt was, was to trade in one's godliness or holiness for something else. Right? That's the temptation that we deal with every day. 
It's the temptation that they were facing. And in this sense, it, it was to trade in one's godliness for sexual appetites. Right? We're talking about Esau. That's the other comparison, right? Because this is what he did. He traded in what was most precious, his inheritance, to satisfy his appetite. That's what he did. To satisfy his appetite for something else. And like the culture back then, listen, not much has changed today. We're tempted, aren't we? We have temptations. No, one, no one's immune to it. We have it. And we often trade our, our birthright as children of God, our inheritance in the kingdom of God for some appetite, right? Some lesser God or thing like sex. You hear me? Listen. Listen. Sexuality has become the new God. The new God of our time. But honestly, it's not so new. It's not, it's not so new. The, the word of God addresses it way back in the first century church. And listen, my friends, whether, whether, like, whether it's sex, whether it's money, whether it's power, or something else, it pales in comparison to our inheritance. It pales in comparison to our relationship and identity as children of God. We need to understand that. That's what the author is trying to communicate. And if I can add one more thing, listen, holiness doesn't just shape us for heaven, but it also shapes us to have the best relationships possible with the people that we encounter here on earth. To have the best relationships possible because out of holiness, listen to this, out of holiness flows love and justice. Out of holiness flows love and justice, a love for God, a love for others. And and I'm not just talking about the people we like here. I'm I'm talking about the people that hurt us. I'm talking about the people that make us angry. I'm I'm talking about the people we don't like, because, you know, we all have that person on that side of the family, right? And God says we're supposed to love them. And the more closely we see God, the, the more we can move all that stuff out of the way with his help and, and be in right relationship with God, the more closely we're going to be able to see those people in our lives the way that God sees them. And then we're going to desire to be in that right relationship with them because guess who else desires to be in right relationship with them? God, the king of the universe. He desires peace, not just the absence of conflict, but things to be right. That's what we look at in verse 14. It seems that peace is directly connected to holiness. And so if we want to please God, or we want peace with God and with others, to be in right relationship with God and others, if if we want earth to be a little bit more like heaven, we've got to root out, get rid of that stuff or sin that separates us from God. And that can be hard. I'm not naive. That's difficult. Sometimes it's uncomfortable. It costs us dearly. But listen, in our struggle, as verse 4 calls calls it, our struggle, we're being shaped for heaven. We're all being shaped for heaven. And so as as we close, actually, I want to invite us to the table Uh, this morning. I want to invite us to taste the bread and drink the cup because there are means of grace, a way that we invite and allow Christ to shape us, discipline us like those who've gone on before us, that have served as our examples. The the very people, you think about it, like we have the last supper that's mentioned in the Bible, the, the last meal that Christ ever ate with his disciples. The The people that ate that meal with him, historically, they, they, they were all, like, killed. Like, historically, traditionally, it, it says they all died. They died for their faith. They said, whatever this life has to offer, it's no comparison to what Jesus has for those who follow him. We're not selling out. Jesus serves as our example. The bread and the cup serve as our example. They're a reminder 
of his body and his blood that was given for us. Consider him who endured the cross, scorning it, shamed. Look down on that and say, that's nothing compared to what my father has. He now sits at the right hand of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so you don't go weary and lose heart. In a moment, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to uh, partake in together. And I would invite each of us, as we do, to consider, right? For in this act, we're identifying with Christ. We're saying, I may be tired. I may be struggling. I may feel like giving up, but I'm not done. I'm not done because God isn't done. And we're believing that as we eat this bread and drink this cup, that he will strengthen our feeble arms and our weak knees so that others can know the hope that's available in Jesus Christ.